have added four observers to the course as well. And they will not be getting any hands-on experience as such, but you'll learn a lot by observing. And maybe if the faculty decides and allows you, you will be allowed to do a little bit on the mannequin as well. So uh, with start, uh, now I'd like to introduce you to our uh, national faculty members. Uh, the uh, and he's one of the co uh, one of the directors of the colonoscopy course as well, Dr. Saad Khalid Niaz. Uh, he's a renowned gastroenterologist of the country, a person who is devoted to teaching and training in the country, and his services have been acknowledged internationally and nationally as well. We are very lucky to have him with us. He's a an honorary uh, consultant and he's the director of endoscopy at surgical unit four. I'll now request him to please come and give you a brief overview of the course. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum everybody. Thank you Sajda for kind, the kind introduction. Okay. Uh, like Sajda said, we are very fortunate, to be honest, to have this course here. Um, and the only thing that I would like to add is that there are hands-on courses, quote unquote, in Pakistan, elsewhere, but no course which is hands-on as we do it. Um, those courses are limited to a few people, sometimes as many as 20, standing around a patient, and then you know, you're given a little bit of a scope touch and uh, that, to be honest, is not really hands-on. But as far as the proper hands-on course is concerned, we are uh, very, uh, very, um, uh, you know, proud to say that we are the only center outside UK uh, doing courses uh, like this one. So this is exactly the same course that somebody would have, uh, would, would, would have an opportunity to do in UK if you were actually embarking upon doing gastroenterology uh, and training, especially if you're going to do colonoscopies, this is a must course. Um, now, um, what we've done before is that um, in UK, you generally have people who are just starting their fellowship or, or their training in gastroenterology when they, or, or surgery, I think, if, you're, if, if you get onto these courses. And initially in our course, we had a lot of uh, basic training as well, which over the courses we realize is, is probably something that we can do as the course goes on. So we've taken off, taken out things like indication and uh, sedation and consent. So that, that's something that we will be discussing during the course um, while the cases are being done. And of course, uh, complications and their management is important as you can see in your thing. What we generally do is we like to know a little bit more about, our, um, about those who are attending the course. Um, so I would just want you to tell me a few things. One, where are you from? Um, how many colonoscopies have you done yourself under supervision or by yourself? And how many times are you getting into um, are you completing the procedure and how long does it take you to do it and what kind of sedation do you use okay so i'll just ask them uh, in case you forget any of these points we'll just ask this is important for us because we then get to know where you are okay and then uh, of course accordingly um, as we go on um, into the hands-on training and, and and other things and and also if you can just say what you think is difficult um, so, if I can start with Dr. Fakhre Alam. Uh, Dr. Fakhre Alam is not here, I'm sorry, he's not here. Uh, just, Dr. Sab, can you just tell me your name and where you're from? Yeah, you can hear
Okay. What what dose of midazolam do you use on average? So what would be the maximum dose of midazolam you would use? I mean, would you go up to comfortably? Uh, five, milligrams. five milligrams. Okay. Would that would that be? Do you have an age thing that you uh, that you um, that that worries you when you're using midazolam, or you uh, when you're using five milligrams? Does it uh, is age an, is age a consideration? Do you worry about age? And if I can ask, what kind of monitoring do you do with this? Okay. Uh, you just uh, saturation? Okay. And, uh, and how many times have you completed your colonoscopy? I mean, it seems like you've done probably about 30, 35, including supervision and yourself. So how many times are you comfortably reaching the, the cecum? Three times. Okay, good. Um, So we've covered sedation. Is there anything I'm missing? No. Okay. Um, the reason why we're asking you is that we'll give you a feedback on what we, what is generally acceptable or accepted uh, elsewhere, and what what is what is what is it that we should aim for. So that it's not to say that you're doing something incorrectly or something um, uh, you know that you shouldn't be doing. It's just that what are the international norms. So we like to know where you start from, and then we'll t we'll tell you what we do. I'm hmm? I'm okay, that's excellent. Wh which bit of colonoscopy you found most difficult? Okay, do you find those patients difficult? But in terms of procedure, is there anything that is particularly? Uh, Okay, uh, so left colon. Next, please. Whoever is the hands on. Hyderabad. Okay, and up to Seekum. Okay, but you've done about a hundred of which you've, you've yeah. but you've reached. So what happens when you don't reach? Is your supervisor takes over and then reaches the cecum, or is that uh, takes over and then reaches the cecum? Okay, and what sedation do you use, doctor? Nalbufen and midazolam. And what doses do you use? So maximum dose is what? Where do you draw the line? That's and if if you're not able to do it, then um, then that's it. Then you shift the patient to something else, or you go above no, that. No, no, no. So if you can't do it with five and ten, you don't go above no, that. No. Excellent. And you monitor saturation and uh, okay. blood pressure and uh, pulse. Okay. And. Uh, what do you find difficult in colonoscopy? First of all, rectox sigmoid junction. After crossing, uh, I mostly struck at uh, hepatic and splenic plaquea. Hepatic and splenic plaquea. Okay. And uh, your center does does a lot of colonoscopy. Yes. And how many people are doing uh, colonoscopy? Uh -huh. Our faculty members are five faculty members. Five. Is this where uh, Amir is? Dr. Dr. Amir, Dr. Amir Gauri, Professor Ali Akbar Siddiqui. Achha, Ali, Akbar. Siddiqui. Ali Akbar is a professor? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, and how many trainees do you have? So eight. Eight fellows. Good. Who is next? Uh, hands on. Hiram is... 
Iram, I know about your unit, but uh, <laughs> Iram is from surgical four. So she's from our own unit. Assalamualaikum, sir. Um, I have done 158 colonoscopy, and my fecal intubation rate is 50%. Okay. And I feel difficulty in crossing splenic flexion and mostly hepatic flexion. Up till now, I'm unable to go up to terminal IVM. Okay. Have you tried or you've not been able to go? I tried, but I wasn't able. Okay. The blame for, for that should literally come straight to me. Because never, I'm almost never available for colonoscopy in this unit except for courses. <laughs> um, okay. Um, the sedation, um, that I'm not going to ask her because I just wanted to get the baseline from others and then I'll tell you what we do so that some of the questions will be answered. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Dr. Farooq Mohyuddin Chaudhary. I'm from Multan, uh, Nishtar Hospital. I graduated from Nishtar in 2012 and uh, went to US for my USMLE. And then I completed my MRCP. Uh, uh, I am a second year uh, gastroenterology resident in Nishtar. Uh, nowadays, uh, my I've done about uh, 16 uh, lower GI uh, uh, endoscopy, and uh, uh, about I think eight of them were sigmoido, and uh, uh, the other eight were uh, full colonoscopy. My cecal in intubation rate is about uh, I think I was only able to uh, intubate cecum just once out of the eight. Okay. So uh, I think it was mostly luck. So. So wh wh what do you think sequel intubation rate should be? What is what is it that that should be really acceptable? Uh, well, my supervisor's sequel intubation rate is about nine, more than 95 percent. So I think I would like to achieve that. Okay, and uh, what sedation do you use? Uh, we usually use uh, nalbufen, 10 milligram, and we usually monitor the patient uh, by pulse oximetry. Uh, and you use midazolam as well. Sometimes. But mostly it's but just mostly nalbufen. It's, uh, it's nalbufen, yes. 10 milligrams. 10 so milligrams. So the patient is given 10 milligrams every once? No, no, we, we usually first uh, dilute it uh, 5 milligram initially and then later on again 5. So you start with 5 milligrams? Yeah, then. we start yeah. with 5. Okay. And I've got difficulties, uh, you know, uh, in maneuvering mostly the angles, uh, especially the sigmoid, uh, the hepatic, and the splenic flexures as well. Okay. So, and also I've got problems uh, is, uh, in uh, whenever I encounter a loop, uh, I'm unable to, uh, you know, uh, uh, de-loop the scope. That is uh, what I'm having problem with. So I've done about 16. Okay. I'm a and beginner. And, and, and obviously you come from a busy unit and your supervisor has an excellent uh, fecal yes. intubation rate. So your, your unit is a single hand colonoscopy technique or two hands? I mean, when you're doing, you use both hands? Or no, no, one. Our, our supervisor encourages us to use only one hand. Excellent. Yeah. Cheek. Great. Thank uh, you. Who's the last? I'm Dr. Fafi Alam from Hyderabad Medical Complex, Peshawar. Okay. So you, uh, you probably didn't hear me. We were just asking... Um, um, just tell us how many colonoscopies approximately does your unit do in a year? We usually do uh, nearly uh, 15 to 20 per day. 15 to 20 per, per day? Yeah. Every day? Every day. Holy hell, that's a lot. Uh, and uh, how many have you done yourself? Nearly 30 to 40. 30, 40. Super. And they, are all sup they were all supervised? Yeah, supervised. Perfect. Yes. How many times were you able to complete the colonoscopy yourself? It is the 30 worth which I have done up to CCOM. How many times? Up to which I have completed up to CCOM, sir. How many? Uh, 30, sir. So you've done it 30? I'm, I'm regularly doing it. Uh, so you've done 30 the, now uh, up to CCOM under G. supervision yeah, and you've uh, gone uh, to uh, all, all uh, of them CCOM? Uh, CCOM, G. Well, uh, I've done a lot, but uh, up to... Um, uh, approximately 30 have to, uh, done to see come. Uh, how many have you done in total? That's what I total asked. Total I'm uh, uh, doing on routine basis up to two, three cases per day. Okay. So, and uh, what sedation do you use? We don't give any sedation. No sedation no at sedation, all? No yes. Okay. And uh, do the patients find it comfortable when you're doing it, especially the women? Most of the time. 
And you're okay with doing the women as well without sedation yes, completely? Sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, you monitor them with, uh, do you monitor them at all because you're not using sedation? Yes, sir. It's oximetry? Uh, no, no, only pulse oximeter. Pulse oximeter. Okay. Do you find, I mean, you're reaching last, uh, you know, you're reaching cecum in significant number of cases that you do. Yeah. What, what do you find difficult in colonoscopy? Is there any issues? M most of the time I stuck uh, in the hepatic flexure and uh, problem with uh, uh, making loop, looping, looping and uh, I can't go so Looping is an issue. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Who's your, uh, who are your supervisors there in Hayatabad? Dr. Ijaz Mohamad Khan, Professor Dr. Ijaz Mohamad Khan. Ijaz Mohamad Khan and who yes. else? Uh, Dr. Khaled Hamid. Khaled Hamid. Yes. So Ijaz and Khaled both oh, are in Hayatabad? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thik. Um hmm? Observers. Observers may con con who is here. I know one, two, three, four. Okay. So we'll start with Masood Koso. Who's Masood? Can you can you pass on the thing? We expect when we are selecting hands-on, we expect them to have to have had some experience in colonoscopy. For observers, there is n we don't want. I mean, it, they don't have to have any experience in colonoscopy, so s they can be zero. Um, so, where are you from? Just more of an introduction for yourself. Sir, uh, I am second year GI resident at uh, JPMC Karachi. Oh, JPMC Karachi with yes, Dr. Nasish Nasish Bhatt. Nasish Bhatt, yes, sir. Okay. Are you doing any procedures? No. We do uh, colonoscopies on our. Uh, no, no, you. Aapne abhi khud kiya hai? So, sir, I have assisted more than 100 colonoscopies and did, uh, I did. Uh, five what is assistance? You stood next to the patient, next to your supervisor, or you actually did it yourself? No, sir. I was next to the, to the supervisor. Next to the supervisor. Yes. So, so you were actually uh, basically observing? Yes, sir. Okay, good. So, you've observed 100? Yes, sir. And when more do you get a chance to do? When will they allow you to do? What is the system? Sir, uh, I have d uh, done uh, five to six. Uh, You've already done sigmoidoscopies. Okay, good. Yes, sir. Good. You realize we are not going to give you any hands-on. Dr. Sajda has been very clear on that because one yes, of the sir. things that comes from the observers is that you know I wish we should have hands-on for observers as well. If we did, then we would actually jeopardize the main reason. This is something that is different from UK. UK courses don't have observers. Initially, we had a lot of demand. Uh, and we thought we'll have some people come and see because those who want to start, you learn a lot. But obviously, you won't get hands on. That's the difference. Uh, okay, Dr. Sadaf. I'm Dr. Sadaf Chishti, resident year three at surgical unit four. I've done four sigmoidoscopies, but have never completed any colonoscopy. So you've done four, so I've yeah, that's that's great. Um, Dr. Ali Rashid. Uh, uh, my name is Dr. Ali Rashid. I am from Surgical Unit 6 and observed around 2 to 3 colonoscopies. Observed about? 2 to 3 colonoscopies. Surgical 6? Surgical 6. 6 is now you before Sharia. Okay. Surgical 6 is doing colonoscopies where? Here? Here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Osama. My name is Osama Saad Niaz. I'm currently a surgical trainee in the UK. And I have not done any colonoscopies, but I've observed, um, I, I don't know the exact number, over 20 colonoscopies with my father. OK. Uh, right. Uh, we have an idea. We have a mix of people with some uh, more experience than others, and that's what happens because obviously mm, this is the flavor of the course. Um, this is a, a basic course. So we, we, you're not going to go back home um, as an expert. This is, this is not something that's going to change your colonoscopy overnight. Okay, what will happen is some of the things that you're doing, which the faculty feels are incorrect will be corrected. Some of the things that you're not doing will 
um, we'll hope that you'll start doing. And we'll give you building, you know, stones so that you can start and then um, hopefully one day reach your supervisor's level, whoever your supervisor is, or, or anyone else. Um, the, the quality of colonoscopy is, you know, colonoscopy, you're looking at a few parameters. Obviously, reaching your target or end of colonoscopy, if it is terminal ileum or cecum, um, in time, safely, without missing anything. And without missing anything, the most important thing is when you come out. What do you think should be the withdrawal time for a colonoscopist? I mean, when you're doing a colonoscopy, how much time should you give minimum when you're coming out? Uh, Five minutes is actually low. Six minutes is the minimum. But they say eight to nine minutes is what, what is really ideal. Uh, but six is the lowest. And that's basically based on the fact that when you're coming out is when you actually look, especially for smaller polyps. So it's that and obviously safety and pain. Some of you use midazolam five and uh, nalbifuin, which is uh, kins. Uh, you know, some only use kins. So you have different practices. Some also use propofol. In our practice here, um, we try and minimize the use of sedation. Okay? So I, we would like to go no more than two milligrams of midazolam and two milligrams of kins if possible. You understand why we try and do it is you do it properly as we'll show you. You will have, the, your patient should not have pain. If your patient is not going to have pain, then you take a step back and say, why do you need to give them analgesics? And the patient does not have pain because you're doing it correctly. If you create loops, and I'm sure at least few of you must have heard screams in colonoscopy. Yes or no? Some of you might have heard patients screaming with pain, right? That shouldn't happen. If, you've done, if you do it properly, it shouldn't happen. You know, once in a while, when you're trying to pass a certain bend, you can have patient, you know, experience pain. But that again should be once in a while. What the faculty here is going to try and do is show you also how you can minimize pain and, and improve on loop handling. This is what we want to do. So those are the basic concepts we want to give you. And when you go back and you keep practicing, that's how you, you know, over a period of time, you will hopefully reach the level that we would want you to, and of course you would want to, to as well. So we'll, we'll have very limited talk, and then what we do is we go on to the, um, to the concepts of loops. And I can tell you that you will probably not get such concepts neither in the books nor otherwise. So please make, you know, try and focus and understand because this will really, really improve um, your concepts and, of course, your colonoscopy. We'll then follow, as Sajda said, go on to the maniquin. The maniquin is different from the real patient. The idea is not completing colonoscopy in the mannequin because I get, you know, the candidate get frustrated that I can't, it's not about that. It's about, do, you know, learning the concepts. And the best use of mannequin is once you've learned some of the concepts that would be taught here. When you go into the hands-on patients, you come back. When you're doing that, you try and see what was it that you were not doing correctly. You come back and try and undo that or try and practice that on the mannequin. Okay? The mannequin is available. We have two things going on at the same time, in fact, three. The, the hands on will be doing colonoscopy, which will be directly, one of the colonoscopies would be transmitted directly with the audio connection. So you can actually sit and observe how he's being taught and what he's doing and what he's being, ex what they're trying to explain. And at the same time, the mannequin will also be available for those who want to practice on that. This is how the course will go on for the next um, almost three days. Okay? 
Um, is there anything else that I have to say without any further delay? We'll just go straight to complications and their management. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, so you can take over. And Before we start formally, uh, I have an announcement to make. We have a course dinner uh, planned tonight at barbecue tonight, 8.30. All right, so all the participants are please requested to attend. And uh, now we'll start. I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Wakar Ahmed. Dr. Wakar is a consultant gastroenterologist at uh, North Manchester General Hospital, UK. He's one of our uh, trainers for the ERCP courses as well. So welcome, Dr. Wakar, and we'll let you start now. Uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Just Waiting for a uh, minute. Uh, one acre. Uh, I'll just wait. I, I just must add here that uh, um, the faculty, um, including the international faculty here, and Sajda, Professor Sajda, Professor Seriar, myself, we are all actually doing this gratis. We don't get paid for any of this, okay? So the only thing we arranged for them was to travel here. <coughs> Nothing is paid to anybody. This is purely to teach you all. So we are here to teach you, and hopefully you are here to learn, and, and we should be able to, and if we can do that, then their trip, uh, all the inconvenience and everything, and our effort, then and obviously they are, <laughs> they will achieve what we want. Thank you. Um, right. Um, we have uh, reformatted the um, uh, structure of the course, uh, so you might find the slide in a bit of a disorder, but anyway, I'll try my best to try to edit them uh, as we s spoke. Uh, it, this is the seventh hands-on basic skills colonoscopy course, and as Dr. Saad pointed out, this gives you a basic concept of colonoscopy. You do not become masters of it. To achieve mastery, to achieve competence, you need to practice under supervision in your program. This is only to put you in the right direction. It is a mandatory course for UK uh, trainee registrars. Every re specialist registrar has to undergo this course before they start their program. So it is on the same. The aim and objective for this module are consent, indication, and contraindication uh, of colonoscopy, sedation and practice, theory, and practice. You will pick up all these things as we go along. Initially, I used to put them in my lecture, but as we try to make it less boring, uh, because during the lecture, I bet 70% of you will go doze off to sleep. So I'll skip all those, but you will be picking those up as we go along. Oh, sorry. Uh, still struggling. Right, okay, basically, we'll go straight to the complications of colonoscopy. Like any practical procedure, colonoscopy has got its own set of complications. And one has to be conscious of that before starting the procedure and in the consent process, because your patient should be aware of what they are letting themselves in for. So bef whilst you are consenting um, uh, them for a procedure like colonoscopy, you are obliged to tell them the incidence of possible complications are the well-recognized complications and what incidence they have. I mean, they can ask you, uh, doctor, can I die from this procedure? The answer is yes, possible, but you have to give them an incidence and rough idea uh, of how uh, frequent death is. Normally, when you are carrying out uh, consent for the, we do not use death as one of the complications, but if they ask you a direct question, then you are obliged to answer that. And the uh, death possibility, just uh, overall uh, uh, statistics is about uh, one in 5,000 in colonoscopy. I mean, if you can quote different series, people have, but those are usually patients who have got other comorbid factors. So doing a colonoscopy, a diagnostic procedure in a young, healthy patient with no comorbid, death is almost unknown. So you have to be really, really crude, rough, or unlucky cause it. Perforation is a very well recognized uh, complication and its incidence depends on your skill levels, on the comorbid factors 
and what procedure you are carrying out. Again, perforation is highly unlikely in a diagnostic colonoscopy in a healthy patient. It is usually the result of a therapeutic procedure or other coexisting comorbid factors in the colon, like ex um, diverticular disease or acute severe colitis, conditions in which one has to be careful. Um, the incidence of colon uh, perforation in a diagnostic procedure is about one in a thousand. Uh, and it depends varies a bit from various series that have reported it. But one in a thousand is a safe figure that you can use. For a therapeutic procedure, the incidence, because if you only select therapeutic procedures in your uh, data, then it is different, it is much higher, it is, can be up to one in 500, or even for big polyps and uh, e EMRs, it can be as high as one in 250 cases. So that is, again, a complication that, and your patient have to be made aware of that, uh, because they know what they are letting themselves in for. Significant hemorrhage. Now, uh, hemorrhage is again a um, well-recognized complication of any endoscopic procedure, uh, colonoscopy included. Uh, it again depends on what you do during your uh, procedure. It is highly unlikely, again, in a diagnostic procedure, even if you take diagnostic biopsies in a patient who is on oral or intravenous anticoagulant or subcutaneous uh, uh, low molecular weight heparin, very unlikely to get hemorrhage from a diagnostic biopsy. So if you are carrying out a colonoscopy on a patient who is on anticoagulants, biopsies are not contraindicated. Hemorrhage is highly unlikely in those situations. Hemorrhage only occurs if you carry out a therapeutic procedure, like polypectomies, EMR, which again is a form of polypectomy, or dilatation of the colon for any reason, or stent insertion. So those are possible uh, risks associated with it. Uh, the risk increase if the patients are on anticoagulants. And there's a protocol for the use of anticoagulants du during the procedure. So if you are uh, contemplating a, a therapeutic procedure, then your patients must stop their anticoagulants according to the recommendations. Uh, certain antiplatelet agents would increase your risk of complications. Uh, aspirin is not one of them, but clopidogrel, uh, an antiplatelet agent, does increase your risk of complications, and normally we are advise them to stop clopidogrel a week before the procedure. Some of the newer anticoagulants are a bit of a, a nuisance. Uh, uh, anticoagulants like uh, apixaban, uh, dabigatrin, uh, you have to stop them at least 72 hours before the procedure. But you can get these guidelines from the perforation during diagnostic colonoscopy, as I mentioned earlier, is extremely rare. If you cause it, you are doing something seriously wrong. Your technique is bad, or you've done something very, you know, stupid. So it shouldn't happen. In a therapeutic procedure, it is possible, and it's a well-recognized complication. But again, you know, we always, whenever we carry out any procedure, the first thing is f try and do no harm. As I mentioned, severe colitis, severe ulcerative colitis is a risk for uh, perforation. And if you are performing a colonoscopy, you find severe fulminant col colitis in the patient, stop your colonoscopy. Do not proceed to the cecum because you are putting them at risk of a perforation. So in severe fulminant colitis, it is perfectly acceptable to abort your colonoscopy because all you need to do from that procedure is the diagnosis that the patient has colitis, the degree of the colitis, and there. Because the treatment is not going to be any different. If the patient has got severe ulcerative colitis, their treatment is intravenous steroids or rescue therapy, which in can include biologics like infliximab or surgery. If you get a complication, or like a perforation, what can make the outcome worse? Like anything, increasing age is always a bad prognostic factor. So if you cause a complication in a 90-year-old, it will, the 
uh, prospects are going to be far worse than if you call it in a 30-year-old. But no one would ex excuse you for causing a complication in a 30-year-old. Uh, significant comorbidity. Anyone with comorbid factors like COPD, ischemic heart disease, hypertension, diabetes, they live chronic liver failure, they would have a far, far worse uh, prognosis. And another important thing, which is very important, is delayed recognition of perforation. If you pick up a perforation immediately, that is ideal. It's unfortunate, but ideal in the sense that you can do something to remedy it. You can admit the patient, you can ask for surgical opinion. You, the surgeon might not operate on them, but still it is important that you are treating them with antibiotics, you are looking after them. The worst thing you can do to yourself and to your patient is to try and hide that perforation. Do not push it under the carpet. If you do, if it happens, it can happen to anyone, own it and treat the patient because that is defensible. If you cause a perforation and it is found out later, then that is indefensible, especially if you try to hide it. So do not hide it because the prognosis is going to be far worse if that patient turns up three days later in an emergency department of another hospital or even your own hospital. So uh, delayed treatment and poor bowel prep. Poor bowel prep because your bowel is teeming with millions and billions of bacteria. So if your bowel prep is not good, you are causing uh, bacterial contamination of the peri peritoneum. Right. Um, risk of bleeding is, uh, as I said, general risk is about 1 in 500, but after polypectomy it can be 1 in 250, 1 in, you know, 1%, um, 1 in 100. So for a major polypectomy it is re relatively high and we are all aware of that. And when you carry out a procedure like polypectomy, especially if you are removing a big polyp, number one, you should be aware whether you are up to doing it. Like if you are a featherweight boxer, you don't go out and fight with a heavyweight boxer because he'll knock you out. So box within your weight. Do not box above your weight. So if you are only capable of doing diagnostic colonoscopies, leave polypectomies to your senior colleagues. Secondly, you should have facilities for um, hemostasis available to you, whether it is in the form of gold probe, heater probe, um, hemoclips, hemospray, whatever, uh, you should have them available with you during the procedure. You shouldn't have people running around looking for things you know, at the time of bleeding because you your window of opportunity is very small. So <coughs> if you are fortunate, you will see the bleeding straight away which is fine. I mean, you know, it can't happen to anyone. We, we've all had experience of bleeding. And as long as you can see it, uh, you can stop it. Um, the problem is if there is delayed hemorrhage, because that is a well-recognized complication of any procedure, whether it's polypectomy or synchrotomy in ERCPs. The patient goes, is fine, nothing happens, goes home. A week or a few days later, he comes with a massive hemorrhage. And that is well recognized. It is, you know, you should warn the patient about it as well. So, now when you do polypectomy or EMR, you should be available, uh, aware of the risks, and that should be conveyed to the patient. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you should be prepared. You should only do it if you are able to do it, if you've done it before. Not that you've seen a video of it and try and do it yourself. That shouldn't happen. Right. Complications of colonoscopy, because colonoscopy is not just doing the procedure. Colonoscopy also involves giving them bowel prep. And bowel prep has got its own list of complications, especially if the patient is frail, uh, is elderly, has difficulty rushing to the toilet, has poor mobility, and if they've got renal impairment, if they have compromised renal function, some of your bowel prep, especially the phosphate-based products, can be hazardous. They can cause hyperphosphatemia, they can cause massive electrolyte imbalance and renal shutdown. So in cases uh, where you know that the patient has got impaired renal function, it is best to use some of the 
other uh, uh, bowel preparation which like clean prep or movie prep, the macro goals. Because in our unit, we routinely use movie prep, but some units use uh, picolax, which in which case they would change over to the renal friendly picolax, uh, the renal friendly movie prep or clean prep. Right, so the, you can see. Again, even in the best of hands, a colonoscopist ability is determined by his adenoma detection rate. The minimal requirement is about uh, 10 to 20 percent, I think, is the people who are good, their uh, adenoma detection rate is above 40 percent. We all are operate around that level, right? So whenever you do, if you do 100 colonoscopies, in 40 of them, you would detect a polyp of some sort. The better your adenoma detection rate is, the better your skills. That's why when Dr. Saad Nias said, how long does it take you to take the colon out from the cecum? If you take it out in two minutes, you'll miss most of your polyps. If you spend at least six minutes or 12 minutes, some people say, you would pick up all those small flat polyps which a normal person would miss. Even in expert hands, the uh, incidence of missing significant pathology, including colon cancer, is 5%. And your patient should be made aware of this in their consent, that there is a possibility we might miss things. So if you've done a colonoscopy, it is perfectly normal, but the patient still has problem with rectal bleeding or, you know, change in bowel habits, they should have another procedure carried out because there's still a possibility of missing pathology, right? Preventing complications. First of all, always assess the patient beforehand. Look for comorbid factors. Whether, you know, especially elderly patients uh, with significant CVS uh, respiratory problems, uh, malignant disease, uh, have got a higher procedural uh, uh, mortality, and conditions like fulminant colitis, um, uh, previous history of radiotherapy, they have higher risk of procedure. Especially if patient, a uh, common scenario is patient who have had radiation for prostate cancer come in with rectal bleeding, they have post-radiation colitis and we do APC in those patients. Those patients try not to do retroflexion in the rectum. Do not do retroflexion in the rectum in patients with severe colitis because those are the cases where you will cause a perf. Women who have undergone any hysterectomy, those are the worst for colonoscopy. They make the colonoscopy more difficult for you due to adhesion and tethering, or for that matter, any previous abdominal procedure would make it more difficult. People who have had bowel resection, right hemicolectomy, sigmoid colectomy, you would think it would be a piece of cake because the colon is much shorter. But mark my words, those are the most difficult colons because the colon has been manipulated it is not in its natural position, and those colonoscopies are going to be difficult. So don't think that if he's had a, unless he's had a total colectomy, then it's uh, no problem. But most of these segmental colectomies are difficult. Um, again, uh, other uh, factors that you would look for, uh, which would increase your risk of complications or make the complication worse, are you know bleeding disorders. Uh, patients if they are on anticoagulants, anticoagulation should be stopped. Um, depending on the condition, uh, allergy to satyrs, diverticular disease. Again, if the patient has extensive diverticular disease, the risk is that you might mistake the diverticulum for a lumen and go through it. Uh, fortunately, incidence of diverticular disease is quite low in Pakistan, but in the UK, we've got a very high incidence and patients have very complex diverticular disease. So if you've got something like that, it's always better to ask for he senior help. The other question is whether that colonoscopy is really indicated in that patient. If you've got an elderly patient with impaired mobility, is very frail, do you really want to do a colonoscopy? Is the colonoscopy going to change the management that you are going to do? If the patient is unfit for an operation, why would you want to do a colonoscopy there? Because if you're not going to make any difference. Or can 
something less invasive be done. And in nowadays, especially with CT colonography, uh, you can do a CT colonography. It will not only assess the colon for you, but will also assess other organs outside the colon for you. So that's a good escape route. So always question yourself before you do anything. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Vakar. Uh, <clears throat> any questions? Okay, uh, we want this to be interactive. Okay, um, we have Professor Sajda and Professor Sharyar and Professor Said Qureshi. There are three professors here, but the three who are actually going to be more with you are not professors. Vakar, you are not professor as yet. Okay, so so relax. Um, we want it to be very interactive. Uh, it's sometimes difficult to understand Paul, so it'll take you a, <laughs> a little while before you kind of adjust to his accent as well as his humor. Uh, but um, he is, in my opinion, he's one of the, he's the best colonoscopy teacher that I've come across. Okay, so he, honestly, you're very lucky. Um, I didn't have anybody like that when I was learning. I wish I had someone like him. Um, so. Any questions? Have you seen complications? Anybody has anybody seen a complication of uh, colonoscopy? You have? Uh, lots of complications in surgical floor that I can see. Um, what complication did you see? Uh, I saw one of my seniors uh, going through uh, diverticulum. Okay. Yeah. But and then what did you, do? was it managed conservatively, picked no, up no, straight away? Yeah, it was picked up straight away. My supervisor so saw, was telling. You saw the peritoneum yeah, and yeah, so. yeah, yeah, uh, It resulted in perforation, and we had to admit the patient, and he uh, got uh, operated on later that evening. You got so up. yeah, uh, we saw just one perforation. So one of the points that Vakar made, you can relate to that. You know, when you have severe diverticular disease, which I have to say, in the last 16 years now, I've been back 16 years from UK. Initially, when I came here, I was surprised that I would not see any polyps and I wouldn't see any diverticular disease, contrary to what I was, what I was seeing in the UK. And um, I had been there for a long time, so, you know, I'd, um, but if I was to look back when I came, and now it's almost one and a half decades, so 16 years, there is a change. Uh, we're beginning to see more polyps, we're beginning to see more diverticular disease. Whether it's because we've started doing more colonoscopies uh, here, because I don't think I've improved. I'm as bad as I was when I came here. Um, so uh, I think, you know, we are seeing slightly more, still not like what Vakar sees there, but still we are seeing at least some. And similarly, polyp detection rate, I mean, that's something that just came to my mind. Would the polyp detection rate be different in a population which does not have as many polyps as? Uh, as the Western population, I'm not sure. So, gastroenterologist from Japan, uh, who was way ahead of us, you know, in polyps and uh, 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 invasive procedure. And at that time, uh, flat polyps were unknown in UK. So he came, and I had the good fortune of working with him. He's quite a famous one, Hironiro. Yamamoto. Uh, at that time, he was not that famous, but anyway, I had the um, uh, good fortune of working with him for six months. And his colonoscopy skills were amazing, which I learned quite a lot from him. Uh, he said that they've got these flat polyps in Japan, and he went to St. Mark's Hospital in London to present his uh, finding, and they all laughed at him. It, they said, oh, flat polyps are a Japanese phenomenon. It's not a UK thing. And he spent six months with us, and he showed us the incidence of flat adenomas was exactly the same in UK as it was in Japan, except for the simple reason that we were not picking them up. So it might, be, I'm not uh, questioning your skills, but the thing is, uh, unless there are other factors. Uh, I, I'll tell you the reason why I say that is because it's, Japan's incidence of colorectal cancer is not very different to your incidence in Europe. Yeah. Whereas our incidence of colorectal cancer is different. Our disease of colorectal cancer is also different. We see a lot more rectal mm -hmm. cancer than, than I saw in the UK. I never saw 18 years old coming in UK 
with colorectal yes. cancer, uh, whereas it's not uncommon for me to see it here. And so, um, whereas I accept uh, what Vakar is saying, of course, Japanese skills in colonoscopy uh, are, and in any endoscopic procedure, or to be honest, in any surgical procedure is way above most centers in the world, or most countries in the world. But having said that, I feel that, um, I still feel that, that probably in, in our population, and there are certain things that are not that prevalent, um, whatever the reason, um, you're doing, um, we've done, this would be, uh, we've already done 250 colonoscopies here. And what I can do is, we can go back on the 250 colonoscopies and check, and I can tell you, of the 250 colonoscopies, we've hardly picked up polyps. You've been with us, and it's a large number. So, uh, you know, we would have, um, and we've had uh, three colonoscopists observing those colons. So if we, um, if we take the, and something that we probably can, I've just messaged Iram, that it's probably worth going and looking back at just the colons we've done at the course and see what was the polyp detection rate uh, in those where the bowel prep was good. And, uh, and that, that would be interesting because that's, that's three colonoscopies watching the colon, so, you know, it's, it's and in fact, a lot more. Yeah. So that's the, uh, the uh, <coughs> perforation you've already mentioned. Somebody else, anybody has seen bleeding? Uh, I saw a late bleeding case. Uh, my supervisor rejected a polyp, and it was in the transverse colon. And uh, uh, he stopped the bleeding. There was a, a slight bleeding at that time. And he used a heating probe, and the bleeding stopped at that time. And, uh, but we uh, admitted the patient nonetheless. And later on that evening, she had black lead stools, and her HP dropped about four points. And Same day? The next day, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so she had uh, bleeding uh, later that evening. That was just one case in my last two years. And the patient settled conservatively? Yeah, it, it settled on, on its own. Not so? Post polypectomy bleeding, but managed conservatively most of the time. Post polypectomy mm -hmm. bleeding. Mm -hmm. Have you seen a lot of it? Was it a large polyp or? Large polyps. Large polyps. Large. Okay, I think a very important point made by Vakar here was don't do something that you're not comfortable with. Don't do something that you haven't done. Just because you come and see it, you see Vakar doing it or Paul doing it, say, okay, well, that wasn't that difficult. They just put a snare and took it out and, and that's it. Um, I think you need to understand the experience. You need to understand what you want to do. You need to know. You need to have the confidence. And last but not the least, you need to have the tools that people understand it. There's no point having clips which your nurses don't understand. And you're both struggling, you know, what, uh, are we supposed to do this or this? I think it's very important before you start something or you're doing something, um, just get, make yourself familiar with what you have. Rather than in, this, in that scenario of panic, you're now trying to uh, settle a, a problem that, that you're not used to settling or handling. And that's very important. I think the colonoscopy, um, indications we will discuss because they will be um, we will be doing 25 colons in the next three days so we'll we'll have a discussion on the indication um, and of course consent there's different um, practices here and and in the rest of the world uh, we need to catch up we are far behind in something as basic as consent forget about the procedures uh, in terms of preparation, we use phosphate-based at the moment, but the um, egg solution has also yes, come here. It, that's also arrived, and it's not very expensive. I can't. I think it's CCL. Uh, Ali, is it CCL? The uh, egg solution, which is One of the companies has has brought that. Uh, uh, Sasha. Sasha, I don't know who has brought it, but global. Okay. Um, and so that is also available, and it's not expensive. So that we are ready, we can ask them to bring the. Uh, and um, so prep, we use phosphate base, which is basically, I think, practiced universally in Pakistan. Most centers I know use uh, use those two solutions, phosphate based solution, which is similar to uh, uh, to that. Uh,
so <coughs> now I, I was just telling Paul, it's good to have you. Um, we've done already 250 uh, colons in the course. Um, taking out the extremely poor ball prep, which happens at least once uh, or twice in the course, and that's why we have more than 25, so we replace them with the others. But and where we found strictures, a few, mm, hardly. I think in terms of reaching cecum here, uh, I can't remember when we did not reach cecum. So it's almost 100%. Okay. In terms of sedation, um, we use one milligram of midazolam and one milligram of uh, nalbupine or kins. And um, go up occasionally. My only slight apprehension is when I'm dealing with female patients where I like them to be sedated because I, it's not something that, especially if they're younger, uh, all patients who are children must, in my opinion, be done under uh, anesthesia of whatever sort the anesthetist recommends. So it's not my headache, it's their choice whether they use ketamine, propofol, or whatever. I, I mean, that's not my problem. They should do so. If you're going to do kids who are less than 18 years, I think it's, uh, it's advisable to do them under propofol, especially if they're girls. You don't want them to have the memory of what is being done to them, especially in a society that's, that's, that's our society. you say in 18, I, I actually then would say there's mature 18s who you could say, and there's not so mature 21, 22s, especially in the females. So I would actually be more inclined uh, to give giving. them. Yeah. No, I just gave you an, a figure, but I mean, uh, this is not something that's, uh, it's an arbitrary number. So I mean, you know, you, you need to evaluate the patient, some 18, like Paul said, would be very nervous, especially there are 20, 21 girls who are very nervous. And, and I think it's sensible to, to think about other options. One thing that we keep pointing out is that propofol-based colonoscopy is more dangerous or anesthesia. Colonoscopy done under anesthesia is more dangerous than colonoscopy done under sedation. Anybody? Why? Why do you think colonoscopy under anesthesia should be more dangerous? Not because of anesthesia. Take that out. The risk of anesthesia is out. Just the colonoscopic procedure. Complication rate will be high. Why? Uh, uh, because uh, the sensation of the pain will alert. So, so the, the reason why you stop and you say, hang on a minute, I'm doing something incorrectly here. I may be forming a loop. Patient is getting uncomfortable, is gone. So you get the freedom of going in. Um, if you're especially not careful, you'll keep creating a big loop, and obviously that's one of the reasons why you would perforate in diagnostic uh, colonoscopy. So if you're, you're going to do propofol-based colonoscopies, you need to be aware of it, and you need to be more careful. Propofol or anesthesia. When I say propofol, I mean anesthesia. -based. Okay. The complication the spectrum is different if the, you do it under uh, anesthesia. It's not just perforation, it is tearing of the uh, sigmoid mesocolon. You literally use so much force that it tears the, and that can cause a massive internal hemorrhage. So always beware. We were going to do waiting for them to set the uh, thing. While you're waiting, any questions? You know, we have, we have this thing that in the first session, everybody is very quiet. Because you don't know what to ask and whether, you know, um, sometimes uh, you learn the most by asking the most silly thing. Okay, so no question is silly. And uh, when we go somewhere to learn, we should ask whatever we want to. 
whatever we are not comfortable with, whatever you want to, uh, whatever, you know, whatever query you might have. But we have noticed in the first session there's very little interaction and then gradually uh, you all get comfortable and start asking. With the concepts being demonstrated here, while Paul is listening to me, barely, um, when he speaks, it's sometimes, that, as I mentioned, is a little difficult, and his sense of humor is um, is good. <laughs> so you just need to be. Uh, you, if you don't understand something, just ask, and he will repeat. There is no point standing there, not understanding, and not asking. Usually, I am around here, and I will explain. But if I am out doing something else, then you must ask. Okay, one of the faculty is always around. Okay. In terms of uh, experience, Paul updated me that he's just uh, reached the magic figure of 72,000. Yeah? yeah? 72,000 colonoscopies. I need to take another uh, life. I, I need to come back next time to... to, to, to to, yeah, just, just to do columns and, and go reach that figure. Um, Paul's love, passion, and, and life is all about colonoscopy. Janet is his wife. Unfortunately, Janet is the second wife, not the first. First is colonoscopy, <laughs> right? So over to you, Paul. All the hands-on can come 